There you are, you splendid fellow time travellers. It's always great to have you with me for the journey through space and time that would be so lonely otherwise. This is ultimately a story about history. It's about my love of history, and you're here because you love history too. It's about love of landscape. It's about a lot of things, but basically it's about taking a, a moment out of the week, out of the, out of the daily grind, and contemplating how we got to where we are. And in search of answers, in search of satisfaction for our curiosity, we look back at the past and wonder if it's all happened before. Spoiler alert, it has. It's all happened before. And the answers that worked in the past probably work again in the present. Before we get started on today's episode, thanks to all the people who are already members of my Patreon.com site. It's that financial support that enables uh, the love letters and all the rest of the podcast series. So if you're one of those, a thousand thanks as always. If you're not a member yet and you'd like to be, uh, go to Patreon.com, look for me by name, part with some cash and join the family. Curious, questioning, history-loving types, competitions, question and answer sessions that you can take part in almost live. Um, it's a whole it's a whole cornucopia of curiosity. It'd be lovely to have you as part of the family. We are the time travellers, so get in there, sign up, pay up, join up and come along. That's the advert over. Now it's time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off for the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. was fizzing with ideas and there was everything to play for and it was a time of white hot change. In this podcast we're stepping into an age simmering with the steadily building heat of technological change and advance. Striding across a landscape of great beauty full of things that were needed to kickstart a profound transformation. The natural energy of powerful rivers, land rich with minerals, coal and iron ore. A heady mix of human ingenuity, innovation and the commercial drive of entrepreneurs. Together, they built a bridge of mesmerising beauty, forged in the first fires of a coming industrial revolution that would transform the whole world. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil, in the last podcast we did something that even today in the modern age still sounds extraordinary. We measured the weight of the world. Ha, yes, absolutely. It was, it was memorable to stand on the shoulders of Isaac Newton, Neville Maskelin, Charles Hutton and the rest of the teams, seeing scientific knowledge rapidly picking up speed. This week, we're in a place marked by the raw power and beauty of the coming Industrial Revolution, a place many cite as the birthplace of that revolution. We're in Colebrookdale, walking over the majestic Iron Bridge. Uh, today, Paul, we're at the Iron Bridge in Colebrookdale in Shropshire. And I would say that this might well be one of the locations for the love letter that's in the category that I would call less familiar. Places like Westminster Abbey, Stonehenge, Avebury, probably more visited, more familiar. You might have to have a slightly more specialist interest to know about the Iron Bridge in Colebrookdale. It's one of those landmarks that's claimed by some as marking the origin of the Industrial Revolution that changed the world. And obviously, it kind of goes without saying that to pinpoint the seat of something so world-changing and to say it started right here is difficult. But Iron Bridge in Colebrookdale is a worthwhile marker for people interested in visiting somewhere that that great event started to unfold from. You can tell by the name Colebrookdale, which was the name of the settlement, 
that it had been long identified as a, a source of minerals. So coal and also iron ore were known to be there in, in large quantities. The Industrial Revolution kicks off in the 18th century. But before that, there was industry of a sort in that location. There was a priory nearby called Much Wenlock. And by the time Henry VIII dissolved the priory during the Reformation in 1536, there was a, a bloomsmithy near the priory. And a bloomsmithy was a, a workshop for smelting iron. And the, and the minerals and the resources were already being exploited, you know, and had been for hundreds of years. Clearly there's a, a river, the Coal Brook, that's a, a little tributary of the River Severn. So there was water nearby, which obviously you need if you're going to do industrial things. And along the gorge that the brook ran through, there were sources of sand and clay and limestone. So it was a natural place for industry. You've got coal, you've got iron ore, you've got plentiful supplies of water, you've got sand and limestone and clay. So the building blocks were there. Now, really from the late 17th century onwards, here in the British Isles, the fires of technological change were being kindled. It was beginning to happen. People, inventive, creative people, were experimenting with what had been available and were trying to improve things. And to Colebrook Dale, because of the presence of the coal and the iron ore, a man was drawn there, attracted there in 1708, and his name was Abraham Darby. He was from Staffordshire, he was a Quaker. He had served a, an apprenticeship as a millwright, working on mills that ground malt for the beer industry. So he had acquired engineering skills. And that industry, the beer industry, was using coke as fuel. So he understood the, the beginnings of the principle of using coke. Now, you've probably heard the name of the fuel that's coke, but m many people won't know what it is. Up until the late 17th century, making iron from iron ore was dependent upon charcoal. But charcoal is timber. And so the supplies, the, the readily available supplies of charcoal are determined by the nation's forests. You can't have any more charcoal than there is timber available for growing. So Abraham Darby at Colebrookdale began experimenting with turning the available coal into coke. Now what you do basically is you, you heat the coal in a furnace and it starts to burn off the impurities like sulphur that you don't want. Impurities like sulphur compromise the, the quality of the iron that you can make. So you want to get rid of the sulphur before you start using the fuel. More by luck, really, than by good judgment, Abraham Darby had anyway stumbled upon a source of coal that was naturally low in sulphur. And then when he then put that through the coking process, he ended up with very high-quality coke, which meant simultaneously that he produced very high-quality iron. So what he was doing with the iron, he was making pots and pans and cauldrons. But they were good, they were high quality. So he made a name for himself, he got a good reputation. And by the time of his death, his factory at Colbrook Dale was flourishing. The business was inherited in 1768 by his grandson, who was just 18 years old at the time, and he was Abraham Darby III, right? So he had his grandfather's name. Because of the, the Darby Ironworks, there was all sorts of industry. Other business people had started to gather, because that's how it works. Where there's one successful business, other businesses gather. It's fascinating that this was the cutting edge technology of the day. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like nuclear power. It's as good as it gets. You know, it's, yes, it, very much so. So you've got lots of busy people in Colebrookdale, but nature dictates that because of their location, they're separated from other communities by the Severn Gorge. So you've got the parishes of Maidley and Benthal, which were either side of the gorge, and those people wanted easier access to one another without having to take the long way round. And so an architect from Shrewsbury in 1773, he came forward and said, why don't we build a bridge 
of Ireland. Now nobody had ever done that before. Prior to that, bridges were made of timber or stone. But he came forward and said, look, you're making tons of iron, literally. Why don't we just make the bits and pieces that we need to build a bridge across the gorge? It will unite the two communities and we can get even more work done. So Abraham Darby Jr., Abraham Darby III, he agreed that it was a great idea. And so together, Thomas Pritchard and Abraham Darby III decided making plans for a bridge across the Severn at Colebrook Dale. And in 1777, they got work up and running. Now, a lot of it depended upon the skill of Abraham Darby's foreman pattern maker, a guy called Thomas Gregory. And he produced drawings of what the bridge ought to look like. And more importantly, the component parts of the bridge. Because obviously they weren't going to make the bridge all in one piece. Like Meccano, they were going to assemble it from parts that they would cast individually. And Thomas Gregory had a background in carpentry, joinery. So he imagined fitting the pieces together with the same sorts of joints that you would use for a wooden bridge. So like mortise and tenon joints, but in cast iron. So they, they worked out how to make all the pieces, all the dovetails, all the wedges, everything that they would need. And then they began producing the, the specific pieces. And so what you've got is rather than the pieces being mass produced in the way that we think of, each one was being made almost by hand and hand finished. So it was right on the edge of, of the old traditions of woodworking and that kind of skill and the emergent skill of working in iron. You know, there's a kind of a blurring of the two traditions that's happening there. Cast iron is brittle. If you bend it, it'll break. And so it only works and it's only strong if you exploit its strength under compression. So cast iron like that can take a great weight pushing down from above and as good luck would have it and with engineering minds involved the bridge that was designed by Thomas Pritchard put all the stress of the of the weight of the bridge pushing straight down and cast iron is good at absorbing that kind of crushing force pushing down Thomas Pritchard actually died before the bridge was completed. So it was Abraham Darby that carried on with the work himself. And fascinatingly, in 1997, so not that long ago, researchers looking for something else in a museum in Stockholm found a little watercolour painting by an artist called Elias Martin. And it showed the work in progress of assembling the Iron Bridge. And it shows boats on the water and using cranes to raise the individual parts of the bridge up into position. So there's actually, you might say, a documentary footage of the bridge being constructed. And it's an elegant span. It's an arch that provides the support of the bridge. So you can actually see it as a work in process. The bridge was finally completed in 1779. And it opened for traffic, you know, horse-drawn traffic, obviously, in 1781. And inevitably, Rather than calling the place Colebrookdale, everyone started referring to it as Iron Bridge. You know, that is how people know the place. It's really Colebrookdale, but everyone calls it Iron Bridge because of the presence of the Iron Bridge. And it's the first cast iron bridge built anywhere in the world. So it, it's a landmark and a special monument all on its own. It was only finally closed to motor traffic, to cars and buses and the rest, in 1934. Okay, so it lasted that long, from 1781 until 1934. And remember, it was only ever built and designed for a, a horse-drawn world, but it was still capable of supporting motor traffic when it was finally closed. As of now, it's, it's a scheduled ancient monument. It's got the same protection on it as Stonehenge. Wow. Yes, wow indeed. Uh, what it stands for is a, is, a, is a concept shift. So what you're dealing with with the Iron Bridge is not just a bridge that bridges the Severn Gorge, but it bridges the past and the future. It joined, literally and metaphorically, the past to the future. So 
The Industrial Revolution was dependent on lots of people in lots of places coming up with ideas that eventually came together to change the world. But it's because of Colebrookdale and the Iron Bridge that was designed and built there under the auspices of Abraham Darby III that that location goes down as a possible claimant as birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. It's part of industry and mechanisation, but does the bridge have an innate beauty in it for you? Yes, it is. It's lovely. But possibly partly because it was built by people who were used to building in other materials. Because its design incorporates concepts more familiar maybe to timber or, or, or other technologies. There is an elegance about it. It looks in many ways too slight to do the job that it did. But it stands as testament to how good the cast iron is and was, and how thoughtful those individuals were in best exploiting its capabilities. They did the right thing with the right material in the right way, and they created something that stands the test of time. So it was a time when innovation and ingenuity and commerce all came together. Yeah, I think we've touched on it before, if, in other places for other reasons. Down through the millennia, you would have had brilliant individuals coming up with a bright idea. But the idea, for want of other people around them, this spark just burnt and then went out. That what you need is the presence around you of, of other people who maybe don't have the same genius that you've got, but they've got other skills. And it's that collegiate, it's that coming together of clever, industrious, ambitious people, really, that makes the difference. You know, a spark of inspiration will only take you so far. And one genius is not enough. It's like Elon Musk trying to get to Mars. He's a genius, but he needs hundreds and thousands of other clever people around him to make his ambitions a reality. You know, Richard Branson trying to get into space for space tourism. Now, he's a man of ambition and a man of vision, but he can't get it done without being surrounded and having the contribution of other people. Because of the time at which the, the Iron Bridge was, was developed and built, it actually runs parallel to the time of the American War of Independence, when the American colonies decided to break away from Great Britain. I mean, that War of Independence, or the Revolutionary War as some call it, began in 1775, two years before work began on the bridge. And the construction phase all happened during that conflict. And the war was ended by the Peace of Paris in 1783. And by that point, the bridge had been completed and had been in use for a couple of years. And the world was a different place. You know, the world was changing in so many ways at the same time on account of lots of different people and lots of ideas. The Western world was fizzing with innovation and it's probably no coincidence that the, the time for the colonies to break away and, and the birth of the United States of America was also a product of ambitious, creative, inventive people all working at the same time. In 1776, the, the Second Continental Congress produced the Declaration of Independence and the world had been changed forever. And at the same time, in a completely different way, in another place, namely at the Iron Bridge at Colebrookdale, the world had also been changed. The latter quarter of the 18th century was just a time when the world was fizzing with ideas and there was everything to play for. And it was a time of white hot change. It's thrilling to imagine being there as it was being built, isn't it? Yes, you, you look at it now and the bridge looks like an antique. It's a beautiful thing. Aesthetically, it's very pleasing. It's an elegant piece of work, but it does look like something from another time. And I suppose it is fascinating and important even to remember that when that was unveiled, if you like, or when whatever opening ceremony was conducted for the, before the first passengers, pedestrians or whatever went across it, it would have been absolutely the future. You know, it would have been like, for them, it would have been like looking at a, a Saturn V rocket or a space shuttle. It was an unbelievable product. Your average punter would have looked at the Iron Bridge in awe. Can such things be? 
So for us, it looks like an antique. And it is something from the past, but you have to remember that for the people who saw it in its first days, it would have had the impact of a cathedral or a space rocket or the internet. The internet is a means by which people are put in contact with one another across a distance. And so is the Iron Bridge. It brought people together and made other things possible. Words travelling to every corner of the planet, bringing folk together, touching and uplifting hearts and minds, celebrating and singing. Auld Lang Syne, poetry and parties everyone remembers, an every man and a national bard who makes you think and contemplate. A man who managed to exert an influence and make the world a better place. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy and post-production is by Althorpe Studios. The graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.